Hello and welcome to Baiju's Exam Prep IAS. Let's take up the analysis of today's The Hindu newspaper by looking at a column from page number 10 of the text and context section which examines the continued suspension of democracy in Myanmar and its growing proximity with Russia and how these developments in neighboring Myanmar affect Indian interests. See Myanmar happens to be a very important neighbor of India. It acts as the land bridge between the northeast of India and southeast Asia. Because Myanmar helps the northeastern states to physically connect with southeast asian countries and their markets and this approach is an integral part of india's look east act east policy then myanmar is also critical for india with regard to its national security and border security see northeastern states such as mizoram manipur nagaland and arunachal pradesh share a long boundary with myanmar and this border happens to be a porous border because of the complex terrain of the region the india myanmar border is known for its hilly mountainous terrain and the region is not just remote but it is also very densely forested which makes it very challenging to ensure full proof border security so as a result various northeast insurgent groups have made use of the porous nature of the india myanmar border to find a safe haven in the neighboring country and they have also used the ethnic links between indian insurgents and myanmar's insurgents to establish a safe sanctuary for their insurgency against india in many cases these indian insurgents who took shelter in myanmar they have often been supported and backed by china as a part of its covert proxy war against india through this route china is known to have funded and supported various northeast insurgent outfits including naga insurgent groups such as nscn the ulfa and other insurgent groups based out of manipur mizoram and tripura then in addition to all these challenges myanmar is also part of the golden triangle region which includes myanmar thailand and laos and it is considered to be a global hub for all sorts of illicit activities including drug trafficking arms trafficking and as well as human trafficking and money laundering these organized criminal activities they are directly linked with insurgency and terrorism and the proximity of india's northeast to the golden triangle of myanmar laos and thailand has enabled the northeast insurgents to easily procure arms weapons and drugs in their insurgent war against india so because of all these geographical and geopolitical factors myanmar happens to be a crucial neighbor for india and it has been india's top priority to maintain close and friendly relations with the government of myanmar irrespective of the political situation in the country if you examine myanmar's political history myanmar has gone through long periods of political instability and quite often myanmar's government has been accused of committing grave human rights violations and despite this india has consistently maintained close and friendly relations with the government of myanmar to understand more about this we need to take a brief look at the history of myanmar's political evolution see back in 1900s myanmar or burma was also a british colony and it eventually gained independence from britain in 1948 following its independence myanmar had a civilian elected government in place for few years but the country witnessed a lot of political destabilization and violence in the 1950s and 60s as a result of its ethnic wars and ethnic violence see several provinces of myanmar are quite similar to the northeastern states of india with regard to their ethnic profile they are home to several indigenous ethnic tribal groups and post independence many of these tribes refused to accept the authority of the civilian elected government and since then they have been leading an insurgency and many areas have even remained autonomous to an extent till date so this continued political destabilization of myanmar in the 50s and 60s and the failure of the civilian government to contain the situation provided an opportunity for the armed forces of myanmar to stage a military coup and to throw out the civilian government and myanmar's army went on to establish military dictatorship in 1962 
and this military regime known as the military janta went on to hold power until 2010 throughout this period of military dictatorship myanmar has seen a lot of violence political turmoil followed by gross violation of human rights for example under the military dictatorship minorities such as the rohingya muslims of the rakhine state were oppressed and persecuted by the military in association with radical extremist buddhists as myanmar happens to be a buddhist majority country after years of political oppression violation of rights and economic mismanagement the military janta finally faced resistance in the form of widespread pro democracy protests and demonstrations that broke out throughout the country under the leadership of a leader known as ong san suu kyi who headed a political party known as nld or the national league for democracy this popular uprising is also known as the 8888 uprising as it took place on the 8th of august in 1988 but eventually the pro democracy movement was crushed by the myanmar military and following international pressure the military janta finally introduced elections in 1990 this was the first free multi party elections that was being held in almost 3 decades and as expected the nld headed by ong san suu kyi won the elections but now the military janta feared losing its influence and control and it refused to cede power it immediately nullified the election results and imposed emergency in the country again and took complete control of political power by not just dismissing the elected government but also by placing all the political leaders including ong san suu kyi under house arrest ong san suu kyi would remain under house arrest for at least two decades which made her a popular pro democracy leader around the world and she was even recognized for her efforts and was awarded the nobel peace prize this brutal repression of democracy and violation of human rights by the military janta invited the wrath of the international community and the country was placed under stringent economic sanctions primarily led by the western countries the united states and the european countries and the european union enforced crippling economic sanctions against myanmar which continued for more than two decades until 2015 finally as myanmar came under the pressure of western economic sanctions the military janta moved towards adopting democracy in 2010 and after amending its constitution the military janta introduced partial democracy in the country it was a partial democracy because the military floated its own political party and retained majority of the seats for itself in the parliament majority of the members of the parliament would be directly nominated from the military and only a small percentage of seats were opened up for direct elections so since this was just a partial transition towards democracy the western countries refused to recognize it and they did not lift the economic sanctions but however during this entire period from 1962 to 2010 there were two countries which were maintaining very close relations with myanmar's military this was china and india even though china and myanmar have several issues which we are going to discuss a little while later china has always maintained close strategic relations with myanmar's military janta and since it was using myanmar to sponsor insurgency against india it was an absolute necessity for india as well to maintain good relations with myanmar's military despite the gross violations it was carrying out within the country so because of the china factor india maintained a very realistic foreign policy towards myanmar and it chose to keep away its ideological commitments towards democracy and human rights and as a matter of policy india chose not to criticize myanmar's military for its internal actions and over the decades it also built very close strategic relations with myanmar's government so this partially democratic government ruled the country from 2010 to 2015 but finally in 2015 myanmar's military janta could no longer bear the impact of western economic sanctions and eventually provided for a full transition towards democracy in 2015 all the emergency restrictions were lifted by the military and the constitution was also amended to pave the way for free elections and it even released all the pro democracy political leaders 
who had been placed under house arrest. But before conducting elections and before handing over power to an elected government, the military ensured that Aung San Suu Kyi couldn't become the president of the country. Through deliberate constitutional changes, they kept Aung San Suu Kyi out of power. But in the 2050 elections, as expected, her party NLD won the elections and she took on the role of a nominal authority as the state councillor of Myanmar. Through this nominal role, she was exercising key decision-making powers through the elected president of her own party who was acting as a proxy for Aung San Suu Kyi. So this transition of Myanmar towards democracy led the Western countries to lift their economic sanctions. But despite all these changes, violence and atrocities continued in the country under the hands of Myanmar's military. During the period of this democratic government, that's between 2015 and 2020, the Rohingya Muslim minorities were targeted by Myanmar's army, thus triggering the Rohingya refugee crisis, which happens to be one of the biggest humanitarian crises seen in the region. All the while, Aung San Suu Kyi and the democratically elected government remained silent over this crisis, thus attracting global criticism and there were even calls in the West to withdraw the Nobel Peace Prize which was given to Aung San Suu Kyi. Even during the Rohingya crisis, China and India chose not to criticize Myanmar's military for its actions and for strategic reasons, India continued maintaining close ties with Myanmar's military. But this democracy of Myanmar was short-lived because in 2020, when fresh elections took place, the NLD again won the elections and this triggered the insecurities of Myanmar's army. The army feared losing its influence and control to democratic parties and it feared the rising influence of leader Aung San Suu Kyi. So the military decided to take back control again and it nullified the elections by alleging electoral fraud and it not only dismissed the election results but it also arrested the political leaders including Aung San Suu Kyi under frivolous charges. Today Aung San Suu Kyi and the political leaders have been arrested and convicted and following this dismissal of election results, Myanmar's military again declared a year-long state of emergency and has brought the country back under military rule. Following this, the Western countries again hit back with economic sanctions and the people of Myanmar who were fed up with the military rule, they broke out in rebellion and protested against these undemocratic acts. But these protests have been met with massive force by Myanmar's military, which has formed the interim government again. And over the last one, one and a half years, there have been widespread killings and human rights violations as the political opponents, dissidents and protesters have been targeted by the army. This even led to a new refugee crisis and several political refugees even entered the Indian states of Manipur and Mizoram seeking asylum in India. But throughout this crisis, India largely maintained a neutral position and India has not only stayed away from criticizing Myanmar's military for all the violations it has carried out in the country, but India has even gone on to build closer relations with the government of Myanmar. India is forced to follow such a realistic policy towards Myanmar, which is termed as real politic, and it is forced to keep away its ideological commitments towards democracy and human rights, primarily because of the China angle. So it is in this context that the writer of the column evaluates the continued suspension of democracy in the country and how it affects Indian interests. It is also interesting to note that Myanmar has always maintained close ties with Russia apart from India and China. And in the current context, the growing closeness between Myanmar and Russia also affects Indian interests in the region. See, just a couple of days ago, on the 27th of March, Myanmar celebrated its Armed Forces Day. This day is marked by Myanmar's army as it commemorates the rebellion of Myanmar's armed forces against Japanese occupation during the Second World War in 1945. While marking this occasion, two important developments took place. One, Myanmar's military leader delivered an inflammatory speech in which he swore to annihilate all the dissidents and labeled the protesters as terrorists. This clearly points towards the path that Myanmar is going to take against any protesters and it indicates that the political situation in Myanmar is likely to continue for the time to come. 
The second important development was that Myanmar had invited Russia as the guest of honor, despite Russia being isolated and criticized for its invasion of Ukraine. To understand how this affects Indian interests, it is important to take a look at the internal ethnic conflicts of Myanmar. See, as we discussed earlier, just like the northeastern states of India, several states of Myanmar are also home to ethnic native tribes. Its border states, which border India and China, such as Sagaing, Kaya, Chin, Kain, etc., they have all witnessed decades of ethnic trouble, and there are several tribal militias and insurgencies which are fighting an insurgent war against Myanmar's military itself. There are allegations that China has sponsored some of these insurgencies in order to gain leverage over Myanmar's military, and it is interesting to note that in the Wa state, which is part of the larger Shan state of Myanmar, the communist armies of Mao Zedong had even invaded these areas back during the Chinese Civil War in the 1940s. But later, China retreated from these areas, giving control back to Myanmar. And as a result, China has a troubled relationship with Myanmar's government. But it is important to note that China has used this leverage against Myanmar's army to provide a safe haven and support for Northeast insurgents who are targeting the Indian government. It is in this context that India has been forced to maintain close relations with Myanmar's military in order to counter Chinese influence. Because the continued sponsorship of Northeast rebels in Myanmar, especially by China, has posed a grave threat to India's territorial integrity and sovereignty. Then upon this, it is also important to examine the close ties between Myanmar and Russia. See, Russia and even Soviet Union have always been a key defense supplier to Myanmar. But also note, that India has also been a key defense supplier to Myanmar. And in fact, recently, India has even transferred a submarine to Myanmar's Navy. Recently, when Myanmar marked its Armed Forces Day on the 27th of March, it not only invited Russia as the guest of honor, but even other friendly countries like India and China were invited. India, however, sent only a representative, but it has been closely observing the growing relations between Myanmar and Russia. Because in the current geopolitical environment, where Russia is being criticized and isolated for its Ukrainian invasion, Myanmar has defended Russia and has not only justified the Ukrainian invasion, but has even supported Russia at the United Nations and many other platforms. This strategy of Myanmar is driven by its need to diversify its defense trade because Myanmar doesn't want to depend on any one major power. That's the reason why it has been procuring arms and weapons not just from Russia, but also from India, China, and other countries such as Pakistan, Serbia, Belarus, South Korea, and even Ukraine. So as and when required, Myanmar uses its leverage with various countries to evade the economic sanctions of the Western countries. Over the last few weeks, Myanmar's military leaders have even been citing the Russian model laid out by Putin, and they have been using it as a justification to carry out internal repression within the country. This is where Myanmar's relations with Russia could become a problem for India. Because for several decades, Western countries have criticized India for its realistic policy towards Myanmar, where India has never criticized the atrocities of Myanmar's army. Now, as Myanmar clearly aligns with Russia, the Western countries are likely to step up pressure on India to in turn criticize Myanmar for its actions and to put pressure on Myanmar. But India cannot afford to do that without losing influence in Myanmar to China. So balancing these complexities will definitely create a diplomatic challenge for India. And hence it is of utmost importance for the political situation in Myanmar to stabilize as soon as possible. Now let's take up a column from page number 9 in which the writers examine the criminal justice system of India and they evaluate the challenges in reforming the system. See, the criminal justice system refers to the agencies and institutions of the government which have the responsibility to enforce the criminal laws and to adjudicate crime and to correct criminal conduct. Essentially, the criminal justice system is a state instrument for social control to deal with the criminals who are breaking the law. Reforms of this system broadly comprises of three different sets of reforms, which includes judicial reforms, prison reforms, 
and police reforms. And the root problem of our criminal justice system lies with our criminal laws, which were codified back during the colonial days. Our primary criminal laws, such as the Indian Penal Code, the Code of Criminal Procedure and the Indian Evidence Act, they all trace back their origin to colonial roots. The IPC was enacted back in 1860 and even though it has been amended several times post-independence, the core principles and philosophies of this law is still rooted in colonial principles. Even the Code of Criminal Procedure, which was enacted in 1973, traces back its origin to the CRPC or the Criminal Procedure Code of 1861. And the Indian Evidence Act, which is used even today, dates back to 1872. These three laws form the pillar of India's criminal justice system and they were all drafted and enacted based on the recommendations of the first Law Commission of India, which was set up in 1834 under Lord Macaulay. He is considered to be the chief architect of India's criminal justice system that we inherited post-independence from the British Raj. So naturally, these laws are rooted in outdated principles and as a result, it has directly affected the efficiency of India's criminal justice system, which leads to several challenges and issues as highlighted over here. This outdated criminal justice system of India has directly contributed to the huge backlog of cases in the Indian judiciary. And according to latest data, more than 4.4 crore cases are pending in the Supreme Court, at the High Courts and at the Lower Courts. It has also contributed to a very high number of under trials due to the long delays involved in disposing cases. And as a result, India has one of the world's largest number of under trial prisoners, which even amounts to the violation of human rights of the under trials and convicts. This even contributes to the colonial hangover on our police system, which has directly contributed to resistance against police reforms. Despite the recommendations of various committees, and the directions of the Supreme Court in the landmark Prakash Singh case, state governments have hardly taken any steps to reform the police system, which has become known for its corruption, brutality, huge workload and lack of accountability and transparency. So this directly affects the delivery of justice and even the quality of justice that is delivered. As these colonial era laws more or less remain the same even today, it has directly compromised the efficiency and integrity of our criminal justice system. In fact, to reform these criminal laws, several committees have been constituted as well. For example, we have the Malumat Committee, which was set up in 2000, and it came out with its recommendations in 2003. But most of the recommendations of Malumat Committee have also been controversial, and they have been hardly implemented by the government. Then we have the Madhav Menon Committee, which brought out its recommendations in 2007, and they are waiting implementation. Then recently in 2020, the Union Ministry of Home Affairs constituted the Ranbir Singh Committee, which has also recommended sweeping reforms to our criminal laws, citing the colonial origin of these laws. And the government has promised to make progress in the coming months to implement some of these recommendations, especially the recommendations of the Ranbir Singh Committee. Now let's look at a column from page number 8 and an article from page number 12 which deal with the BIMSTEC grouping. The BIMSTEC is an important regional grouping, which stands for Bay of Bengal Initiative for Multi-Sectoral Technical and Economic Cooperation. This grouping was formed in 1997 through the Bangkok Declaration, and it has brought together the key littoral states and adjacent areas of Bay of Bengal to focus upon economic and technical cooperation amongst the members. Initially, when the group was founded, it was known as BizTech, as it only included Bangladesh, India, Sri Lanka and Thailand. These countries were the first to come together to form BizTech and later Myanmar joined in December 97 to make it the BIMSTEC. Then in 2004, Nepal and Bhutan were also included into the grouping as both countries are dependent on the Bay of Bengal for accessing the sea and eventually the name of the organization was changed to BIMSTEC which today stands for Bay of Bengal Initiative for Multi-Sectoral Technical and Economic Cooperation. This institution is headquartered in Dhaka in Bangladesh and the group acts as a bridge that connects 
few south asian countries with few important southeast asian countries in fact the grouping wasn't receiving much attention in early 2000 and when it was about to lose its relevance it was revived by india in 2016 because in 2016 india had decided to sideline sark as it had adopted the sark minus pakistan approach following the uri terror attacks as sark was failing repeatedly to achieve regional integration due to the adverse role played by pakistan in sponsoring terrorism india started shifting its attention towards another grouping that is bimstech this priority shift towards bimstech also aligned with india's policies such as neighborhood first policy and the act east policy of india so today the bimstech is emerging as a key grouping that is centered around the bay of bengal which is at the very center of the indo pacific region now this topic is in news because sri lanka is currently holding the chair of bimstech and it is holding a hybrid summit of bimstech leaders where few leaders are participating virtually in the summit whereas few leaders are physically attending the summit so on the occasion of the bimstech summit the hindu carries a column to highlight the importance of bimstech the writer of the column argues that at the ongoing bimstech summit being hosted by sri lanka there is a tremendous opportunity for the bimstech members to focus on development cooperation in the region he points out that the most important development at the summit is the adoption of the bimstech charter which will lay down the objectives and priorities of the grouping even india's foreign minister who took part in an interaction yesterday with other bimstech leaders highlighted the adoption of bimstech charter as a landmark achievement as it cements the position of this grouping in the indo pacific region at this summit the bimstech members are adding more momentum to the group as they have agreed upon several agreements and deals and this includes the much anticipated bimstech master plan for transport connectivity this will provide for interlinking of transport connectivity routes between south asia and southeast asia and will significantly boost the economic and strategic significance of bimstech india for example has several key connectivity projects focused on the region including the india myanmar thailand trilateral highway project along with the kaladan project with myanmar we also have ambitious road rail and inland navigation connectivity projects with bangladesh which can further help us connect with northeast of india and myanmar and the rest of southeast asia india is also exploring key connectivity projects with sri lanka and these existing projects along with the new projects that are being planned under the master plan for transport connectivity will truly promote regional integration in and around the bay of bengal the members are also expected to sign the bimstech convention on mutual legal assistance treaty in criminal matters which will provide for cooperation in criminal investigation and also for extradition of criminals between the countries this will further boost their cooperation in security matters and they are also working on a technology transfer facility to boost technology cooperation between the members and the group is also focused on capacity building and they are finalizing an agreement to promote cooperation between their training institutions and diplomatic academies in order to train their respective officials bureaucrats diplomats etc so as the bimstech truly emerges as a central grouping of the indo pacific it has diversified its focus into several other strategic areas as well such as coastal and maritime security counter terrorism intelligence sharing and cooperation cyber security cooperation and in fact under india's leadership the bimstech members have already held a military exercise and as well as a disaster management exercise that was focused on hadr operations or humanitarian assistance and disaster relief operations and the focus of the members on connectivity projects and tourism will further boost the economic profile of bimstech and further promotion of tourism and people to people relations will also help in leveraging the soft power which will truly help in transforming the bimstech into the bridge between south asia and southeast asia because these member countries they not only have a shared geography in the form of bay of bengal but they also share tremendous resources between them and they also have a rich history and cultural and civilizational link it is in this context that india has implemented its promise of establishing a dedicated center for bay of bengal studies 
at the Nalanda University which India is trying to revive as a part of its Act East policy. So all these initiatives of BIMSTEC which are primarily focused on development cooperation will truly help in transforming the grouping into a primary grouping of the Indo-Pacific region just like the ASEAN. Now let us look at two articles from page number 1 and 12 which helps us understand India's growing strategic influence and investments in Sri Lanka. As Sri Lanka is facing a grave economic crisis, India has offered nearly $2.4 billion in financial assistance to Sri Lanka in the form of currency swap arrangements, loan deferment and line of credit facilities. Using this as a leverage, India has managed to strike key strategic deals and investments with the Sri Lankan government, which until recently was hesitant to involve India in these projects and instead was seen to be favoring China in all these strategic initiatives. So let's take a look at the upcoming important initiatives of India in Sri Lanka. India has won a contract to develop fisheries harbor in the northern province of Sri Lanka in and around Jaffna at places such as Point Pedro, Pesalai and Guru Nagar. This will primarily benefit the Tamil fishermen who have been displaced by the ethnic conflict. And along with this, India is going to develop one more fishing harbour at a place known as Balapitiya that is located to the south of Colombo. Recently, Indian company Adani Group won a contract to develop the West Container Terminal after losing the East Container Terminal project to China. Then India and Sri Lanka have agreed to establish a maritime rescue coordination center to provide for search and rescue operations in Indian and Sri Lankan waters with technological help from Bharat Electronics Limited of India along with a grant of $6 million from India. India has also promised a grant to help Sri Lanka establish its unique digital identity project on the lines of India's Aadhaar. Then after India extended this emergency financial assistance to Sri Lanka, it has managed to win key projects that India was seeking from a long time. This includes the development of oil tank farms near the Trincomale port on the east coast of Sri Lanka, along with the development of a solar power project by India's NTPC at Sampur. But more importantly, India has managed to win the renewable energy projects that were slated to come up at islands near the Jaffna Peninsula known as the Delft Island and the Naina Thivu and Analai Thivu Islands. These projects were initially handed by Sri Lanka to a Chinese company. But India saw this as a major security threat as these projects would come up very close to the India-Sri Lanka maritime boundary line and very close to the coastline of Tamil Nadu. India's strong opposition to these projects led Sri Lanka to put these projects on hold with China. And after India delivered emergency financial assistance to help Sri Lanka overcome the emergency crisis, it has handed over these renewable energy projects to Adani Group of India. Apart from these strategic investments, the two countries have also signed two defense deals, which includes the gifting of a floating dock by India that would enable joint maritime security operations. And India has also gifted a Dornier aircraft for surveillance and reconnaissance. But the biggest development has to be the establishment of the Colombo Security Conclave, which was recently announced by India and Sri Lanka. See, India, Sri Lanka and Maldives, they already had a trilateral maritime security agreement that was signed in 2011. But India wanted to expand this agreement further as a part of its Sagar doctrine and under it, it was seeking to extend its military influence and diplomatic presence across the Indian Ocean region. So India wanted to expand the trilateral grouping to include Mauritius as well, which is another key Indian Ocean country. This long-standing dream of India has been fulfilled now that Mauritius has joined the group and it has been named as the Colombo Security Conclave. And interestingly, India has brought on board even Bangladesh and Seychelles as observers to the group. And most likely, even Bangladesh and Seychelles are going to be admitted as members to the Colombo Security Conclave. So this helps us understand India's growing strategic influence and investments in Sri Lanka under its Sagar doctrine. Now coming to the last topic of the day, let's look at this article from page number one, 
which refers to the signing of an agreement between the government of Assam and Meghalaya to end their border dispute. See, yesterday Assam and Meghalaya have signed a historic agreement in the presence of the Union Home Minister in order to resolve a long-standing border issue between the two states. This historic agreement resolves the 50-year issue at six of the 12 disputed locations. See, pre-independence, that is during the colonial era, the state of Assam was a very large province which included present-day Nagaland, Arunachal Pradesh, Meghalaya and as well as Mizoram. Post-independence, these states were carved out between 1960s and 1970s and this division has been contested by Nagaland, Arunachal Pradesh, Mizoram and Meghalaya and they all have border disputes with Assam. I am sure some of you will remember the last year's clashes between Assam and Mizoram which turned violent and it was a result of an escalation of the boundary dispute between Assam and Mizoram. So to avoid a similar situation with Meghalaya, the two states moved quickly to negotiate and resolve their boundary dispute. See, Meghalaya was carved out of Assam as a separate state in 1972, but Meghalaya had challenged the Assam Reorganization Act of 1971 and had claimed that 12 specific locations belonged to Meghalaya in the border areas and not to Assam. These 12 disputed sites are located along the 885 km long border between the two states and I have mentioned the exact locations of these disputed areas as well. Amongst these disputed areas, the major point of contention was in the district of Lang P in West Garo Hills district that you can see in the map over here that borders the Kamrup district of Assam. See, during the British colonial period, the Lang P region was part of the Kamrup district but after independence, it became part of the Garo Hills and later it became part of Meghalaya. But Assam still considers this to be a part of the Mikir Hills of Assam and Meghalaya has disputed these claims and according to Meghalaya, Assam's ownership of Mikir Hills is limited to the Karbi Anglong region. So Meghalaya had claimed these regions by stating that these disputed areas near the Langpi district belong to United Kasi and Jentia Hill districts and this had led to a long-standing border dispute at 12 different locations between the two states. But fortunately, the boundary dispute between Assam and Meghalaya is considered to be the least problematic amongst all the disputes that Assam has with other states. So through negotiations, both the states have worked out a settlement with the mediation of the union government and at six disputed locations out of the 12 disputed sites, the two states have agreed to resolve their disputes and they have signed a historic agreement that brings their bitter dispute to an end at these six sites. In total, there were around 36 villages in these six places, covering an area of 36.79 square kilometers. Based on recommendations of various committees of both state governments, the two states have agreed to divide the area. And as for the final settlement, Assam will get control of around 18.51 square kilometers of area, whereas Meghalaya will get full control over an area of around 18.28 square kilometers. With the settlement of the dispute at six sites, the Union Home Minister Amit Shah has termed this as an historic agreement as it settles nearly 70% of the border dispute between Assam and Meghalaya. Now let's take a look at the mains practice questions. The first question, examine how the current political situation in Myanmar and its proximity to Russia will affect India's interests. The second question, India's criminal justice regime is beset with problems which seem ingrained in not only the constitutive fabric of institutions, but also in the psyche of their functionaries. Kindly write an answer to these questions and post your answers in the answer writing portal for which the link has been given in the description box below. So with this, let's conclude our discussion for today. Thanks for watching.